we're just going to start here right away with a word of prayer. So, okay, well, let's let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath that's coming, at least for me. I guess it's already here, and for some people it's not here yet, but um, we just uh, pray for your presence as we open your word together. We're thankful for the things that you've been teaching us, and we ask for your continued uh, guidance through your spirit. Um, help us to understand the issues of the past and how they relate to the issues of today. May your spirit bring a conviction uh, to our lives and a power uh, to overcome sin. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so last week we started reading uh, Wagner's uh, A Confession of Faith, and, and this is just a different version of it. I, I found that I had edited this back in 2017, in, in March of 2017, so I figured, well, I have uh, I have it edited there. We could probably make this a little bigger font, though. So anyway, last week we were we were looking at um, what Wagner was saying about well, sin is not an entity, as you see there, and neither is it a debt. Um, he's arguing that sin is a disease. Now that's one illustration. So what I've tried to what I tried to explain last time and what what I see is that there's different types of errors that people make. That is uh, the error that Wagner makes. He makes a number of them. One is you're going to see that he he's going to take some things too literally. That's the same error that uh, Joseph of Arimathea made, right? When Jesus came and spoke with him, right? He's the one that uh, I got the name right, I think. The guy where he said it must be born again, right? That's Joseph of Arimathea, correct? Oh, that's uh, Nicodemus. 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 Okay, yeah, I, I knew I was. It just didn't seem right. <laughs> okay, yeah, Nicodemus. That's the one that he talked to. Yeah. So when he's talking to Nicodemus, you know, he's going to make that error. He's just going to take something literally when when it's it's obvious that it's not meant to be taken literally. Part of the, the problem is we have the truths of scripture that are speaking of divine things and we use earthly things uh, to relate to divine things. And we see this problem with, uh, with the anti-Trinitarians, for instance. And I, and I don't necessarily blame people sometimes for their positions um, because we all have different minds. Some people have a, a more difficulty with analogies, abstractness, and the Bible is full of abstractions because it is, that's the nature of Hebrew, it, the language, the very small vocabulary, um, and it uses uh, a lot of imagery uh, to, to illustrate the truths of, of reality, right? The truths of the gospel. Sometimes what people do, what, what Wagner is doing is, one is he's doing a little bit of, um, bait and switch i mean he ta he talks about how you know we need to just believe the axioms of scripture the plain statements in scripture and not use philosophy and then he's going to use philosophy he's and that, you know the problem is so, you know i have a real problem with trying to point out flaws that other people have especially as we we look at um you know what's happening in the movement presently so people have have taken positions where instead of actually laying things out plain for everyone to see and make a decision, we are being manipulated. And, you know, I understand that, that, you know, I mean, I understand how to do it. I used to be a salesman. I used to do door to door sales. And one day I, I, I realized what I was doing. I was using these sales techniques. And I vowed never to use those. And so when I opened up, um, well, first the art gallery that I had, and then later on uh, the guitar store, I I never manipulated people. And um, because I just couldn't, with a clear conscience, manipulate people to buy something that they didn't need or didn't really want, just because it might be better for me in the short term. 
And I always recognize in the long term, it's always best to treat other people the way that you would want to be treated and allow people to make their own decisions. And that's, of course, true when it comes to presenting the truth. Um, because you could manipulate somebody to believe something, but that doesn't benefit them. And, and it doesn't benefit you. We have to be really honest with ourselves about the things that we study and make sure that what we believe is the truth and leave everything else up to God. Because if we, if we are honest, if we, we speak the truth, we live the truth, obey the truth, the truth will win. And we will be on the side of truth because the truth will win, but we'll be on the side of truth. And so we have many things that we believe that are not correct because we're faulty human beings. And God doesn't judge us by what we know, but he does judge us by our response to truth. That is, how we respond to things that are true uh, will definitely affect us. Right? So when we're presented with truth um, through the Holy Spirit, we have an opportunity to see the truth. And that truth is going to reveal to us something about ourselves that we may not want to face. And the reason people reject the truth is pretty simple. is Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so my judgment of Wagner, based upon his history and what I know about him, is that he chose to believe a lie because of his sin that he chose. And when you choose sin, you are choosing to believe a lie. Did Adam and, did Adam and Eve believe a lie? Did Eve especially believe Agreed. a lie when she chose to sin, right? So, you know, it's not always clear cut just because we present something to somebody doesn't mean that they understand it or see it or can perceive it. It doesn't mean they're rejecting the truth because they may not see it yet. But we all are faced with truth. And we have to accept the truth that we can see that is bringing that conviction. So, you know, the reason we go towards that light is because we want our deeds to be exposed. We want to see the sin in our lives. Those that avoid the light don't want to see the sins, the sins in their lives. The thing, the thing that's sort of ironic, though, is if you come to the light, if you respond to truth, God allows us to bear seeing those sins. He's going to strengthen us, encourage us, help us. The Holy Spirit brings conviction, but he also brings uh, righteousness and justice or judgment, right? So we, we can experience, you know, what God wants to do in our lives if we come to him. doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it is always the best thing. So in evaluating what's happening within the movement and what's happening within Wagner, and we're going to see with A.T. Jones when we study his apostasy, and I think these are important things to study. If you're going to study the 1888 message, we need to know where Wagner went astray and where Jones went astray. And, and with Wagner, it, he was teaching the truth. And, and that sometimes is a problem for people because they're like, well, he preached the truth. If the truth could not have saved him, how can the truth then save me? But we know that it's not really about what decision Wagner made in the end. It's not like he, and the way that it's it's sort of dealt with by people like George R. Knight is the reason that Wagner and Jones apostatized is that, you know, they had these seeds of error in their thinking, um, you know, that last generation theology kind of idea. And that's not the problem. The problem wasn't their, their, their what they were teaching, because Ellen White endorses it. Uh, the problem was just like all of us, they, they made decisions. And I, I don't know the heart of Wagner. I don't know exactly how that happened. But I can see here in his thinking that he is not the same writer that we read earlier when we read the two books on Galatians. So you're seeing this, you know, the two books on Galatians, what, it's written in 1886. And this is, uh, the date for this was, what was the date again? I think I have the date here. Yeah, 1916. So you're looking at, at a man 
So it's what, 36 years later, 30 years later, I mean. So a lot can happen in a person's life in 30 years. And, uh, and so we all have to be aware of that. Just because somebody preached the truth, advocated the truth for a time, doesn't mean that person always will. Well, we're saying we've seen that in uh, probably this movement, you know. Yeah. So people, people can fall away from us. What's that? Having trouble hearing. I said people in this movement, uh, the teach some of the teachers, they uh, they're just gone, they just disappear. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't mean that you know what they were teaching was error, right? But but sometimes people think that that's the case. They say, well, they they left the message, they left Adventism, so obviously they must have been teaching error, and and that that's not the case. So he talks about sin is not an entity. And neither is it a debt. Well, the Bible plainly teaches sin is a debt, right? Now, he's not giving us a scripture here, uh, but we can look at some scriptures that address that. Well, one of the things we would have is just simply in the Lord's Prayer, we got forgive us our trespasses. We also have forgive us our debts. Are they the same thing? I would think so, yeah. Yeah, they're the same thing. And a trespass is a sin, isn't it? So if you say give us our trespasses in, in one gospel it uses trespasses, another one it uses debts. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Right? It's the same thing. Whether it's trespasses, sins, debts, they're the same thing. So to argue that sin is is not an entity, well, you know, I'm not really sure what he means by that, because he says it's a disease, right? So that's that's his position. It's a disease. But to say it's not an entity, it's not a thing. Well, obviously, it's not a, you know, it's not something that's alive. I'm not sure what he means by entity, uh, why he's trying to say it's not an entity. It is a thing. It can consume us. It, it you know, it, as, as a analogy, it is an entity. And also, it is a debt. Right. So then he says, well, it's not a debt in the ordinary sense of the term. So he's kind of trying to qualify this to be canceled by the payment of something, even of a life by and to some other person. So his whole argument was sort of, well, it, it's it's not a, the debt is something apart from the debtor. But I don't think it is. Right. I don't think sin is something that's that's like he says, sin is part of the sinner. And I believe debt is part of because it's the same thing, right? It's the debt is something we owe because of sin. Because even here to say sin is part of the sinner, well, what is sin then? We are, we are sinners. Right. Well, yeah, we're our sinners. But if he's trying to say that that debt is something apart from the debtor, but sin is part of the sinner, how is sin part of the sinner in the way that debt is not part of the debtor, right? That that's what I don't understand. Now he he tries to argue this. It cannot be removed or satisfaction be made for it by the abstract gift of a life. Well, I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I would think it is true that a debt can be paid by a life. If if I was a murderer and I received the death penalty, did I pay the debt uh, for murder? And the answer would be yes. Right. Or if I committed a crime, let's say not murder, but I you know, I went to prison, I will have paid my debt. The difference here is that Christ is going to pay that debt for us. Yeah, that right. was that was done when Barabbas, Barabbas was when Jesus was um, when they hollered for Barabbas instead of Jesus being. They wanted Barabbas instead of Jesus. Jesus. I mean, that was like paying of this debt, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, he paid our debt for us. I mean, yeah. Christ did pay our debt for us. He died the death that we should have died so that he could live his life in us. Now, we all have to die, though, right? In order to receive of Christ's life, we also have to die. Like, we have to die to self. We have to surrender our lives. So it's just that because of what Christ has done, we can live forever. Right. So Christ has paid our debt 
so I don't I don't follow his argument here. I, I just think it's it's playing around with words. Um, so he says this fountain of living waters open for sin and uncleanliness, uncleanness, uncleanness has always been open, always flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Men have always been called to take of it freely. Only by taking it constantly do even the unfallen angels retain their sinlessness. So he is making this argument about the fact that, so he doesn't believe that there is this different dispensations, right? That the benefits of the cross, which is true, the benefits of the cross have always been available. But he doesn't like the idea that Christ is going to be a priest at some time, that he's always been our priest, right? He's going to be rejecting the idea of the investigative judgment. That's where he's leading to here with these arguments. And that's why, you know, he dealt with that prophet, priest, and king and says that they, he's all of those always, all the time, where Jones showed that they happen uh, uh, consecutively. He's first the prophet, he's then the uh, priest, and then he's then the king. So, so this is this is how Wagner's going to be arguing, and and he's going to use you know a little bit of maybe not so much flowery language, but illustrations that really, uh, and and Kelly pointed this out last week, you know, sort of mysticism, which is quite a bit different than what he wrote before, you know, thirty years earlier. Okay, so I'm just going to read this again. The fountain of living waters, open for sin and uncleanness, has always been open, always flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Men have always been called to take of it freely. Only by taking it constantly do even the unfallen angels retain their sinlessness. The water from the rock in Horeb, the water and blood uniting in one stream from the heart of Christ on the cross, and the pure river of water of life flowing from the throne of God, in the midst of which is the Lamb that was slain, all these show... That which was from the beginning, the word of life, has been and is constantly flowing. The gift of God's life, which since the fall comes only by the cross of Christ, is not an event of the day, but the great fact of eternity. No one ever had to look forward or backward, but only upward and within to find the cross. Its arms span eternity. Through all the ages, it stands unchanged. The restorer of life to those who have lost life and the preserver of life to those who have never forfeited it. It has always been the one way of salvation for the sinner and will remain the science and song of the saved through eternity. Now he is not completely wrong here. It is true. But the one thing I find interesting here is that he's going to be using, he's not speaking literally when he's talking about this water. He's using these as illustrations of something. So the water of life has always been available. And, and in the past, it was, this was revealed through uh, different dispensations, right? We have, you know, Moses with the water from the rock. Well, the water itself is not what is going to save a person. Even that when Jesus talks to the woman in the well, she says, give me that water that I may, you know, always, you know, have it, right? And Christ says, um, I'm trying to remember the exact words. The, the water I give you shall be as a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So Jesus is not talking literally there. He's using water as an illustration. And, and you're going to see that Wagner will sometimes use things as analogy, and then he will fall into a strict literalism in order to reject things he doesn't agree with. And we will see this here. He says, I know that this is open to a technical objection on the crown that the cross signifies the curse and is a symbol of shameful death and that therefore it cannot have existed before the fall and could not exist after the restoration. This is easily made plain. Take the original command to the first pair. Be fruitful and multiply. The birth of children means the gift of life. The mother gives her life to the child. In the present state, this gift is accompanied by pain and intense anguish. The mother may anticipate the birth of a child with longing, and after it is born, she rejoices. But there is no joy, but only sorrow, in the act of giving birth, the bringing of a new life into existence. But we know that if there had been no sin, there would have been no sorrow in childbirth. The joy of anticipation would have been intensified in the uh, physiological act of bringing forth. Childbirth is the same thing that it would have been if there had been no sin, 
but a change of condition makes it painful. So here he's uh, he's trying to argue that the cross can't exist, that it exists through eternity, but it's just, um, anyway, I'll go on and read more. It's I just don't find this argument very convincing. So with the gift of God's life, that the universe may be people, God had a longing for children to surround him. He brought forth the angels, sons of God, by the gift of life, and the joy of anticipation was not dimmed in the fulfillment. Man also, the son of God, was the product of the gift of God's life, and still his joy was full. But sin came, and death passed upon the whole race of God's children of earth. What shall he do? that his banished be not expelled from him. Do just the same as he did in the beginning. Give his life freely, that his children may be born again. The mystery of the new birth is identical with that of the first birth. Both are acts of creation by the gift of life. But sin causes the gift of life for the new birth to be accompanied by pain, since God must needs bear our sicknesses and take our death. It may be said, therefore, that the cross exists from eternity to eternity and that sin causes it during the period of sin's duration to be connected with pain and shame. Or we may say that the one thing which exists from eternity to eternity is the gift of God's life for the creating and recreating of men and that sin makes the cross the only way of entrance for that gift. What words one uses to describe the thing is a minor matter. The great truth is that men are recreated by the exercise of the same power by which man was originally created. In both cases, it is Christ who is the mediator, the medium through whom the work is accomplished. There's not necessarily anything wrong with what he said here, but he's placing this in the context of trying to argue against an idea, this technical objection. That the, that the cross signifies the cursed as a symbol of shameful death and that it therefore could not have existed before the fall. Well, we know that Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So I don't know of anybody who would make that argument, you know, within Adventism to say that the cross did not exist before the fall and could not exist after the restoration. I, I would say that that cross is... Uh, the way that I look at it is the cross of Christ is the character of Christ and that all who have Christ's character who are going to be in his kingdom will live by the principles of the cross. That is, heaven isn't a place of self-indulgence. It's a place of self-sacrifice. And we, we maybe can't understand that in the context of, of heaven. We don't understand what that means presently because we just know this world. But I don't think anybody would argue what what he's arguing against, but he has a reason for it, right? So he's trying to say that all of these things are, have always existed. And so the idea of the investigative judgment doesn't make sense to him. Anyway, let's go on. Seeing these simple fundamental gospel truths clearly made it evident to me full 25 years ago that there could never have been any changes or differences of dispensation in God's work of saving men. The river of God is not subject to floods and droughts. Its flow is constant and even. Its banks are always full. It is as Whittier expresses it. Mortal love forever full, forever flowing free, forever shared, forever whole, and never ebbing sea. Um, so he's saying this is 25 years earlier that he came to see that there there can never have been any changes or differences of dispensation. Now, I don't know if he's telling the truth here, but it could be that um, by 1891, that this these ideas started to come into his mind. It's possible, but I don't think they were as fully developed as they are here. Christ crucified was as much a reality and as available in the days of Moses and Isaiah as in the days of Paul. And of course, we would all believe that. So I don't think that's that that has anything to do with there not being a change in dispensation. Uh, the revelation of Christ as Jesus of Nazareth from the manger to Calvary and all of it is but the removal, as it were, of a fold from the screen that separates the invisible world from us so that through the opening, we may get a view of what is constantly taking place. 
There's probably a bit of truth to that. Um, neither at the cross nor before or since has there been any new feature introduced, any change in the ways for sinner to approach the throne of grace. Uh, Christ has from the foundation of the world been the lamb slain. His life has always been the one perfect sacrifice for sin, and his royal priesthood has been unchangeable. He is from the first to the last, the one mediator between God and men. He has borne the sins of the world from the beginning of sin, and he has taken away the sin from as many of the world as have been willing to have it brought it out of their lives. So again, this is a partial truth. Um, it's true. Salvation has always been through Christ. There isn't a different way of being saved. A dispensation is not that some people are saved by works and then later on some people are saved by grace. Right. That that's not what we mean by a dispensation. It's God dispenses the gospel at different times in different ways. And one way that, you know, it's often been expressed is uh, that God's revelation is progressive. And much as a, a child, uh, you know, is first under tutors. Right. Paul uses this illustration. You know, first, you're a child, you have to be disciplined. And as you grow and mature, you have a different relationship than you would if you were a child to the law, right? So I don't, I don't quite understand why he takes this position because it's not, it's, it's a sort of a false dichotomy. It's not, it's not, it's not an either or. It is true. And it is also true that God at different times, in different ways, has spoken to his people. And we, I mean, I don't know how you could read the book of Hebrews and say that God has never changed in how he relates uh, to man. Right. So let's let's just go there briefly. And, and notice he's not using a lot of scriptures here. God says that he, God changes not. Yeah, God, God is, is the same. But how he relates to us is definitely different at different times. You know, because even if you look at Hebrews chapter 1, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the pro prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So God has changed uh, in different times and in different ways. God has spoken to his people in the past. First to the fathers by the prophets. And now in these last days, he sent his son. If we look at uh, Hebrews chapter eight, where we have Jesus as a high priest of a better covenant. Here, did you see what I'm looking at? So we obviously have, you know, Mo it says um, in verse five of chapter eight, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Right? So, I mean, all through the book of Hebrews, he's comparing the past um, dispensation of the old covenant with the new covenant. He does that also in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So I have, I have a really hard time with the, what he's trying to argue. He's trying to argue that since all men have always been saved by grace through faith, that that means that there's no such thing as a dispensation. Well, he's saying we don't need no investigative judgment. Right. Well, that's where he's going to go to, right? So he's going to reject the idea of the investigative judgment. So, so we all believe this. You know, so there is a kind of a truth to it. But, you know, God gave animal sacrifices for people to offer. We do, now do not use um, animal sacrifices. We are in a different dispensation. There's a dispensation, um, you know, when Adam and Eve sinned, when they were kicked out of the garden. There's, there's changes in which God had for a time. He had a theocracy under Israel, where he directly communicated to the high priest. We no longer have that. We don't have a high priest on earth. We have a high priest in heaven. So it, it, to me, it's just, it, it's, 
It's just not supportable by the scriptures. Yeah, how, do you, how can you ignore uh, Hebrews and Revelation though, and other places? Well, you're, he's basically ignoring the entire Bible. Yeah. Yeah, so he says, neither at the cross nor before or since has there been any new feature introduced, any change in the way for sinners to approach the throne of grace. Well, there has been, because they used to bring an animal sacrifice to the door of the tabernacle and then to the door of the temple. So so God has, in different dispensations, uh, different ways to approach him, things that are present truth. It doesn't mean that anybody was ever saved by animal sacrifices because they always pointed to Christ. But God commanded us, the Jews, to do that, right? So so he says here, also 25 years ago, these truths coupled with the self-evident truth that sin is not an entity, but a condition that can exist only in a person made it clear to me that it is impossible that there could be any such thing as the transferring of sins to the sanctuary in heaven, thus denying that place, and that there could consequently be no such thing either in 1844 AD or at any other time as the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. Right? So you can see what he has done. He's He says, this idea of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary um, couldn't have happened. Now we know looking at Hebrews, uh, that it talks about the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. It says, well, I'll go there. Now get rid of all these Greek numbers there. So he's saying it can't be no transfer of sin from from the sinner to the heavenly sanctuary. Yes. So what is he saying? That's what he's well, saying. Well, let's right. see. Let's see what he says. It's pretty ridiculous. But... Um, you know, here in Hebrews chapter 9, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant or testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of internal, e- eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must also, by necessity, be the death of the covenanter uh, or testament or testator. For a testament or covenant is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is no strength while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns in the thing of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Right. So heaven needs to be cleansed with better sacrifices than the patterns of the heavens were cleansed with. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So we know he only dies once. Now, when it says he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, we can see that Christ had offered himself at the beginning. But he actually comes here. He's promised in when the gospel is given to Adam and Eve. But there does come a time in history 
when he actually does die on the cross. He does, um, you know, he has the role of prophet, priest, and king, and he's a priest offering himself. So it says, as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So we can see that this totally goes against Wagner's uh, viewpoint. Now, this part is a little bit disturbing. Then what took place in 1844 is the question he asks. And that question, question puzzled me for many years, for I've been thoroughly indoctrinated with the idea of the 2300 year period ending in 1844, that it never occurred to me to doubt it. Indeed, I never did doubt it for a moment, but one day the light had dawned upon me. Oops, I need to switch the screen so you can see this. And I saw that that period had no foundation whatsoever. And then, of course, I simply dropped it. Okay, you had a comment there, Jeff? He calls it indoctrination. Yeah, yeah. Terrible things. <laughs> yeah, he's just got to he's got to use the word indoctrinated, right? Now, of course, I, I was never indoctrinated in the 2300 days. I just studied it. Um, never accept anything that anybody tells me unless I can prove it. But he just says he saw no, the per that period had no foundation whatsoever. And then, of course, I simply dropped it. So, so he believed that there was no foundation, which I would totally disagree. I think there's, we've seen that the foundation for the 2300 days is solid. But the question is, what happened first? Now, one of the things I find interesting, because I, I read lots of anti-Adventist literature, I've always enjoyed it, seeing how people think, and they always have, they always can just sort of, with a wave of a hand, reject something. You know, we're not going to see a whole bunch of really good arguments Um you're going to see often misrepresentations of what we believe. So I, I you know, I went down to uh, Oregon back in 2017 and had a discussion with uh, or a debate with a guy who had been an Adventist. And, um, you know, it was ridiculous. I mean, he just completely misrepresented everything Adventists believed and believed that that was honest in a debate. And when I tried to point out that he was dishonest for calling me dishonest, <laughs> that he got really upset, you know. So he could call me dishonest, but I was not allowed to call him dishonest. So I, I found that quite telling. But he, he was dishonest. He he was misrepresenting what Adventists believe. So um, so this is kind of what happens. People can just dismiss something. But he doesn't explain here why he believed that period had no foundation whatsoever. Okay, and so he's saying that this is quite a long time before. And, and I would say it probably would coincide to some degree uh, with his adultery. Anyway, he's not going to tell us about that, though. How did I learn this, you ask? Well, I suppose I should never have seen it if I had not been for so many years fully convinced that the thing which I, from my boyhood, had been taught took place in 1844, did not occur then nor at any other time. But what about the 2300 days? Are we to throw away the prophetic rule of a day for a year? By no means. That rule holds, but it is no application in this case. For the simple reason that the eighth chapter of Daniel makes no mention whatsoever of 2300 days, not the King James Version nor any other version, but the Hebrew text must settle the question. It says 2300 evenings and mornings literally evening, and actually it's evening morning, as correctly rendered in the revised version. Yes, this is E.J. Wagner. I'm reading E.J. Wagner. That's who I'm quoting from, his, his book, his Confession of Faith. Now, of course, we know that this is a silly argument uh, to say, well... It's there's also no wrong, too, ain't it? Well, I mean, it does say twenty unto 2,300 evening morning, then she'll the same plan. But it's still wrong, right? Well, he's wrong, yeah. Obviously, Wagner is wrong. Yeah. Just because it says 2,300 evening morning, 
The reason it says evening morning is the reason that we see it as a symbol. Every time you have a prophetic period that's written, that's to be understood as a symbol or a period of time to be understood as a symbol, it's written in a way that you would not normally uh, describe a period of time. Like time times and a half. We, we would not normally say three and a half years as time times and a half, right? It tells us we're using a symbol or I will prolong to punish you seven for your sins. But that doesn't make any sense grammatically in Hebrew, which means that our attention should be drawn to it to recognize that it's a symbol. Uh, the same would go with, um, you know, 42 months. You know, we wouldn't usually talk about three and a half years as being 42 months or even 1260 days. You wouldn't call three and a half years, 1260 days, right? So that means we understand it as a symbol. So just because it says evening, morning, evening and morning is one day. So 2,300 evening, morning is 2,300 days, which is a symbol for 2,300 years, right? And, and he's going to argue against this. He says, but it is asked, does in an evening and a morning make a day? Yes, but what reason have we for gratuitously assuming that the term here is here used as a paraphrase for a day? In that case, we should have a figure of a figure, which doesn't actually make sense. Obviously, the reason that we have a figure is because we know that it's a symbol. And that would be true of all the prophetic periods. Um, we are placed under the necessity of interpreting a figure of speech and then taking that interpretation as a prophetic figure, which we always do. Uh, when a prophetic symbol is used, the symbol itself ought to be absolutely clear, needing no explanation. OK, is there a basis for that statement? Is it true when a prophetic symbol is used, the symbol itself ought to be absolutely clear, needing no, no explanation? No, that's not true. No. So so he says this. He is, makes this assertion. But there's no basis for that assertion. But here we are told to believe that we have for the figurative day, a term that is never elsewhere used in the Bible for the word day, which is why we take it as a symbol. Why should we assume an exception here? There is a Hebrew word that is everywhere rendered day, and it is only for uh, the only word for day in the Hebrew language. It occurs more than 2000 times in the Hebrew scriptures. Has it never occurred to you to wonder why an exception should be made here? Yes, it has. And I understand why. It certainly rests with those who claim an exception here to show the most clear and convincing proof of the alleged fact and to give a plain and conclusive reason, therefore. If the translators of the 1611 version had translated the Hebrew words air of Boker, evening, morning, instead of substituting day for the proper rendering, I doubt if even the maintaining of a theory would have led anyone to light upon so far-fetched an interpretation, and I disagree, actually. I think it would have been even more clear if it had been written as evening, morning. I ask again, what reason can be given for the introduction by inspiration of a new, absolutely unknown and clumsy expression instead of the simple and well-known word for day if the reader were intended to understand day? If it had said day, we would then understand day, wouldn't we? But if it says evening, morning, we now know it's a symbol. So I say clumsy expression, meaning only, of course, as a circumlocation for day. In reality, there's nothing clumsy about it when taken in its obvious sense. It seems so obvious as to need no argument that the term evening, mornings, when used in connection with the sanctuary, must refer only to the evening and morning sacrifices. Now, that is a stretch. So... Are they ever called the evening and morning sacrifices anywhere in scripture? Repeat that again. Are the, are, are, the, are the sacrifices ever called the evening and morning sacrifices? No, they're not. No, they're not. What are they called? Sacrifices. No, they're called the morning and evening sacrifices. Oh, oh okay. Okay. All right, I misunderstood you. I apologize. Yeah, so, so... So the fact that they're written as as evening and morning is actually more in connection with Genesis chapter one. It was evening and morning one day, 
it was evening and morning. That's the order when we use it in connection as a day, as a symbol. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So when you look at evening and the morning, you're going to see that in Genesis chapter 1. You're not going to see it in connection with the, the sacrifices. You're going to see also, you know, evening and then in the morning, dealing with uh, the, 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 what are they called? The birds, right? <clears throat> uh, the quail, right? But you're not going to see and, and you're going to see it in connection with the, the, the veil of the tabernacle. That one is going to have evening and morning. But when it comes to the morning and evening, the burnt offering, that's morning and evening, not evening and morning. Right? So every time you see morning and evening, it's in connection with uh, the burnt offerings, morning and evening, not evening, morning. Okay? So so his argument is false. I, I understand what you're saying now. You're saying he put, in, in other words, it's morning and evening sacrifices. Right, not evening, morning. Okay, all right. I see what you're saying now. Evening and morning is is one day, right? So yeah. that would be an obvious connection to recognize an evening and a morning in that order refers to a day, where the morning and evening sacrifices are yeah. in a different order. So if we were to understand them in connection with the morning and evening sacrifices, which is the way that they're always written, then they would have been written morning, evening, not evening, morning. Right. So so it's it's a faulty argument. And the thing is, he knows the answer to this. Right. I mean, he knows that. That that it's it's morning and evening sacrifices, not evening and morning sacrifices. And he knows that evening and morning is a day. In Genesis chapter one, but he's not going to he's not going to present the options for people. He's going to present his view in a um, polemical manner, right? It is in an argumentative way without allowing the reader uh, to recognize what's really being, you know, wh what, what, what it is that they can choose from. He's, he's purposely picking and choosing his arguments, and we should never do that. Well, ain't it kind of deceiving? Well, I call it a deception. So what, one of the reasons when I write papers and I, and I do it in the way that I do is, is I like to look at what other people might say. I'm, I'm always thinking about what somebody else might think. And so I try to answer the objections that could come up. Um, and I try not to hide um, the argument. I try, you know, try to be deceptive in some way so that person doesn't consider something that they maybe should consider. I, I, I like to be open and clear because that the reader, if you don't, if you don't address the real problems um, in the end, the only person you're going to be convincing is yourself because the other person is going to know he didn't address this properly. He didn't think this through. Right. And so you, you, especially if you're, you know, you're trying to present something as, as, um, completely as you can, you're going to present the other side and look at it in an honest way. And he's not doing that. And then incidentally, there comes in here, of course, a consideration of the application of the little horn. Consistency demands that the horn of a goat should be of the nature of a goat, a process, a continuation of the animal in question. But this would preclude the ap application of the Grecian horn to, horn to Rome since Greece and Rome were two distinct independent powers. Why is there any more ground for saying that Rome came out of Greece than there is for saying that Greece came out of the Medo-Persia or the Medo-Persian came out of Babylon? Now, do we have the Roman horn coming out of Greece in Daniel chapter 8? When we have this little horn, does it come out of one of the four horns? No. No. Where does it come from? One of the four winds, correct? You're correct. One of the four winds. Yeah. 
So one of the four winds, one of the directions of the compass. And which direction is it going to go? Right. So so if we look at Daniel chapter eight, so let's go there. So we're going to see um, the ram is going to push westward, northward and southward. And that's Persia. Right. And then you're going to have a goat. He comes from from the west on the face of the whole earth. Right. So we're going to see that that's what what the goat does. He comes from the west. Verse five. OK. And he smashes into the uh, the ram that had two horns, breaks his two horns, and then the goat wax is very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken, which is Alexander. And, and for it, or from it, came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them, out of one of which? The four horns or the four winds? It would have to be the four winds, right? Yeah, it's out of the, one of the four winds. Now, how do we know that? So how do we know it's out of one of the four winds and not one of the four horns? By using the Hebrew masculine and feminine words. Okay, I didn't quite. Uh, are you talking about the westward, northward, southward? No, I'm just saying it talks about um, in verse 8. Uh when the great horn was broken and from it or for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. So those are the four directions of the compass, right? And then it says, yeah. out of then came forth a little horn, right? And, and the question is, it came out of one of them. What is the them referring to? And we say In it's context, going to follow directly four winds, the one of the winds. Okay, but, mm. and, and this is my question, Theodore. Yeah. The, for, the, the, the verse eight says, from four notable ones towards, towards the four winds of heaven. Right. But is it, is it saying that it don't say that it came from, does it? Okay. So it's just saying that Alexander's kingdom is going to be broken up in the four directions of the compass. Right. Four right. Five. Towards the four winds of heaven. And then it says, out of one of them came forth a little horn. The question is, when it says out of one of them, we believe that that's referring to one of the four winds or one of the direction of the compass, not, yeah. So, yeah. So we know that them uh, would, be, would it not be the four notable ones. Would it not be one of the four notable ones? No. No, it's out of the winds. And we know that because of the gender of the words, right? So I'm just trying to find this here. The reason I was asking is when my son asked me the same question. Yeah. So when we look at uh, the winds, now wind is a feminine word. And, and sometimes it could be masculine. But in this case, it's, it's a feminine plural. Because Ru, ruach means wind. And this is ruach vot. That's feminine, right? Okay. So out of uh, the four winds of heaven, right? So it's gonna they're gonna go towards the four winds of heaven, right? And and that word word winds is a feminine word. And then it says, and I'm just looking at here, and out of one of yeah. So this is going to go out from. This is masculine. So the horns, let me see, I'm trying to figure this out. Looking at this Hebrew is tough. Is it, I have to look at each one. Some of these forms are not familiar with. So, um, so when we get to from out of, in separate, please, yeah. to go out or come out, out of is, is in the masculine third person masculine. So the them in verse nine, I was just checking. So out of one of them came forth a little horn. That's all masculine. So the them is, is masculine. The winds, I'm going to have to look this up. This is just taking too long. Anyway, the point is we got a masculine and a feminine there. So yes. Okay. I see what I'm doing. 
got to look at the right. Well, it was seen to me. It was seen to suggest that four notable ones just went towards the four winds of heaven, which they just, ah. they just. Yeah, you know, yeah. But I'm saying that there's a masculine and feminine there, and I'm just trying to figure it out for these different words. So, right. so when it says, um, "and out of one of them," that's feminine, and the winds are feminine, but the horns are masculine. That's what's happening. So the one, so I'm just trying to figure out uh, which word is going with which, and it's a little bit slow. But I need to, anyway, we'll deal with this later. But the point is, the the ones that, that where it comes out of, is it comes out of the winds, not the horns. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. To me, anyway. Yeah, it, okay. So, so his argument there, um, that it comes out of one of the horns. Well, we know that Rome does not come from Greece. Now, the other thing, of course, is it comes forth a little horn and it waxes exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. So which direction is it coming from? It's coming from the north, ain't it? No, it's, so it's so going to go to the south? Well, we, we could say the northwest. <laughs> Okay, but the point is, it's is it's it's coming. It's not part of Greece. It's coming and and conquering the Greek Empire, right? That's Rome, and then it's gonna this this little horn is also gonna be feminine and masculine, which is kind of weird because it, it says um, it waxed great. Well, that's feminine, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. And yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. That's masculine. That's pagan Rome. Right? So when it's papal Rome, it's going to be feminine. Um, and when it's uh, pagan Rome, it's going to be masculine. Okay. But anyway, he's ignoring all these things because he, he doesn't really care about what's true or not. He's just bringing up the arguments that that he could bring up. It is true that a victory over the Macedonian king gave Rome great prestige, but not so great as the victory over Darius gave Alexander or the conquest of Babylon gave Cyrus. I don't know. Rome, like its predecessors in universal dominion, originated in territory to the westward of the kingdom immediately preceding it and had an origin as distinct from Greece as Greece had from Medo-Persia. And that's exactly what we can see in the scripture there. So so that's why the little horn does not come from Greece. The facts do not fit the interpretation which Seventh-day Adventists have given the prophecy, which they actually do. Strangely enough, the chart that has always been used by the denomination and the supposed picture of the goat, which still appears in the books and articles devoted to this prophecy, plainly shows the inconsistency of the interpretation. Look it up if you do not have the picture in mind, and you'll see the little horn marked Rome is represented as coming from behind the goat, and that the goat horn marked Syria is represented as uniting with that previously existing little horn instead of the latter coming out of the Syrian horn. The awkward picture contradicts the words of prophecy, but if it had been made true to nature and to the text, the little horn could not have been labeled Rome. So what he's talking about is the goat head on the 1843 chart. Is that what he's talking about, or is he talking about a different chart? When, What's that? The little horn. He's talking the about the 1850 chart. He's talking about the 1850 chart, he? I don't know. Because um, that got a horn running all the way down from the um, Greece and from Greece. I think it's a good, yeah, good. Okay, so, yeah, so he's talking about um, the little horn coming down from Greece. Yeah. Okay, so it's the 1850 chart he's speaking of. The Roman or Fourth Empire. Yeah. So they show it coming from the goat itself. Now, on the 1843 chart, there was a goat's head that was added, which shows a little horn coming right on one of the horns of Greece. But yeah. So they're just saying that, uh, anyway, whether or not the image in the chart should be that way or not, has nothing really to do with whether he's correct or not. If you understand what I'm saying, because that's not what we understand. We 
you don't understand that Rome comes out of Greece. Now, I don't, I don't know about the Syria thing. That's what I can't see on the chart. Um, so I'm trying to figure that out. I'm looking at the chart and I don't see what he says he's seen. I don't see anything about Syria. So I don't know if he's referring to the 1850 chart. Anyway, <clears throat> I thought, I think he's talking about the 1843 chart because that one does. And I have seen pictures with the Syria horn, but I don't know if that's on the 1843 chart or just somewhere else. Okay. <clears throat> I thought to devote a little space to a positive consideration of the application of the little horn, but I will not cumber the argument with it. I did not really need to refer to the horn at all, it being sufficient for my purpose in dealing with the atonement to show that the eighth chapter of Daniel does not contain any long prophetic period at the end of which sins are to be blotted out. My only burden in this writing is that sin is not an entity, a commodity that can be taken away from a person and deposited intact somewhere else awaiting its final destruction. Since no earthly sinners have ever been in the sanctuary in heaven, their sins can never have defiled that place, necessitating its cleansing. But the sanctuary at Jerusalem in Judea, which alone was the subject of Daniel's anxiety, had been most horribly defiled by Antiochus and did need cleansing. So that's where he's going to have the little horn as being the Tychus Epiphanes, Tychus the fourth, right? That's what he's saying. And he's saying now, now I'll be honest say, with you. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what he's saying. Well, that's what he's saying. And, uh -huh. and he's also saying then that heaven can't be defiled by our sins. But we read in Hebrews that the heavenly sanctuary has to be cleansed. Right. Right. With better sacrifices than the earthly sanctuary have to be cleansed with. Because it's better, right? So Christ, it's his blood. He enters into the sanctuary in heaven and cleanses the sanctuary. Right? His blood, uh, because Christ takes upon himself our sins when he dies on the cross and his blood is shed. That blood carries symbolically the sins, right? Now, is Jesus literally sprinkling blood in heaven? No, no, that that would be a bloody mess. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so he's going to go here. Um, he's going to talk about that, but we're, we're going to we're going to stop here. So we'll pick this up again. Let's see where we are. Um, and maybe I'll just read a little bit more. What about the investigative judgment? Yes, indeed. What about it? In truth, there is no responsibility resting on me to say anything about it, because in the entire Bible, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 inclusive, there is never once any mention of such a thing. A long time ago, I found that the only way to avoid misunderstandings, to avoid misunderstandings in Bible discussions, was to keep clear of theological terms not found in Scripture, and hence not susceptible of Bible explanation. A brief consideration of the judgment in general will show that there's no place for an investigative judgment before the coming of Christ. You will pardon me for quoting several passages of scripture in full instead of merely giving the references. I want the truth that they contain to stand out so boldly that it will be apparent what a libel upon God it is to assume that he is under the necessity of investigating the record of men's lives and characters in order to ascertain whether or not he can take them to heaven. Is that what the investigative judgment? No, that's not what the purpose is. Uh, no. God doesn't have to figure it out. It's the investigative judgment is for the universe. Uh, right. And for the benefit of those being investigated as well, that they may search their own hearts and lives. Like the first investigative judgment was in Genesis 3. Yeah. So, I mean, to say that there's just because the term investigative judgment isn't used in Scripture, it does talk about the judgment. We just use the word investigative to distinguish it from the executive judgment. Is there an executive judgment in the Bible? It would be like saying that 2520 is not mentioned in the Bible. Yeah. And and there's no 490-year period mentioned in the Bible either. Yeah. There's only 70 weeks, right? I, I bring that up to 2520 <laughs> That's it's what it'd be like doing. That'd be like, that's what it'd be like doing and saying it, you know. Yeah. When it is, 
when it is there, they just don't see it. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, we, we read that. We're going to come back to this next next week and look at the rest of his arguments. But, um, it, it's not pleasant, you know, reading this. Oh, but it's, necess- it's, ne- it's necessary, though. <laughs> I think yeah. it's right to see. It's necessary. Yeah. What's that? I have a question, if we could, before you close. Okay. Um, when, when you're talking about the female, male, or how, how do you say it again? The little horn is masculine. Feminism, and feminine. Masculine and feminine. What is that really about? Because it's not about, you know, male and female. What is, why do they, what's that about feminine, masculine, and what? How does it how how does it help interpret the scriptures? Well, because when it's and referred why to Hebrews use it. Okay, well, most languages have masculine and fem words are genderized, right? English doesn't do oh, that. Okay, but why? Well, it's yeah. just what languages do. You know, like certain things, like like a wind is always a female, hmm. right? Okay, I just don't understand the why of it. Yeah. So, don't need to, but... yeah. So with within in uh you know in Hebrew in Daniel chapter eight in the Hebrew, it uses um with the little horn, it sometimes refers to it as a feminine and sometimes as a masculine. And every time it's masculine, it's pagan Rome, every time it's feminine, it's papal Rome. So there's right. there's things that you can look at. So it's just it's just a, a feature of Hebrew that is often part of the interpretation interpretive process that we don't see in English. We actually, I mean, we can see it a little bit because it says it. When it uses it, that's the feminine form because there's only masculine or mm-hmm. feminine. There is, I guess there is neuter in some sense, but usually just, just use the feminine um, to refer to the neuter. Does it have anything to do with uh, feminine referring to the church fem- and masculine referring to the world or no no okay no okay so let's close dear father in heaven thank you for the study today and we just pray that you can bless the sabbath in our time that we have in studying and worshiping and praying and contemplating your word and we pray that you can bring us together tomorrow uh, for the studies in the morning and um We pray and thank you in Jesus' name.